chapter 23, Concepts of Care for Patients with Non-Infectious Upper Respiratory Conditions. We'll begin with upper airway obstruction, a little bit of pathophysiology review. This is an interruption in airflow through the nose, mouth, pharynx, or larynx. This absolutely can be a life-threatening condition, therefore early recognition is essential in improving um, complications, which can include respiratory arrest. Um, we'll talk through some causes here. This can be tongue edema, um, can occur post-op, trauma-related, angioedema, as an allergic response to a medication such as an ACE inhibitor. There can be tongue occlusion, which can lead to loss of gag reflex, muscle tone. Um, tongue occlusion can also come in a state of unconsciousness, such as coma. Laryngeal edema, this can be from smoker, toxal ins inhalation, allergic reactions such as anaphylaxis, peritonsal and pharyngeal abscesses, we'll talk about that in this chapter, head and neck cancer, um, thick secretions, history of neurological disorders such as cerebral edema and stroke, then also trauma related, um, severe burns at the face, tracheal um, and larynx or foreign body aspiration. Upper airway obstruction, recognizing cues. Um, your assessment here, noting partial or complete obstruction. Is your patient experiencing diaphoresis, tachycardia, increased anxiety, elevated blood pressure? Are we noting evidence of hypoxia, hypercapnia, restlessness, and sternal retractions? Now assessing for what may be contributing to the upper airway obstruction um, may have to intervene with suction, abdominal thrust for removal of a foreign body, um, cricoid, um, thyroidotomy, tracheotomy, and then intubation to maintain oxygenation. Now we're going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea as a form of airway obstruction. This is going to begin on page 523 of your text. This is a sleep disorder where a patient will experience partial or complete airway obstruction. Um, this is interrupting ventilation leading to hypoxia and also interrupted sleep. During sleep, the head and neck will relax, allowing tongue or the soft palate and neck structures to be displaced. This is what's leading to airway obstruction. Um, this is termed as a type of breathing pattern during sleep um, where you have hypoxia lasting 10 seconds, um, occurring a minimum of five times in one hour of sleep. The apnea decreases gas exchange. This is going to increase blood carbon dioxide levels and lead to acidity in pH. These blood gas changes is then going to stimulate neural centers in the brain to promote um, the patient to awaken. The awaken, awaken usually co comes in after 10 seconds or longer of an apnea period um, to correct the obstruction, correct the acidity, um, and allow for um, return of regular respiration. Then unfortunately, after a patient returns to sleep, this cycle repeats, um, sometimes as often as every five minutes. Then let's talk about some causes for obstructive sleep apnea. We just said this was a mechanical obstruction um, of the soft palate or tongue. There are some risk factors here that increases the risk of OSA, including obesity, large uvula, short neck, um, smoking, large tonsils or adenoids, so basically a crowded oropharynx, and then oropharyngeal edema. Also contributing factors that impair healthy sleep are related to health equality, including financial distress, um, a non-therapeutic environment, um, shift work that throws off regular rhythm of sleep, um, limitations or barriers to access of care, especially related to sleep health, occupational hazards, and racial discrimination. So prioritizing your assessment, history may consist of persistent daytime sleepiness. This is sleepiness that occurs no, no matter how long the patient has had access to adequate sleep. Um, snoring, reports of GERD, physical assessment findings, important things will be assessment of height and weight, calculation of a BMI, um, jaw, neck, chin, oral cavity looking for crowded or no fair necks, um, and a thickened neck. Cardiovascular system, we'll talk about why as that's related to significant 
complications of the cardiovascular um, system when OSA is undiagnosed and untreated. Psychological assessment including irritability, personality changes, depression, and this was also related to poor sleep um, and the presence of these signs and symptoms. May also report in, inability to concentrate, morning headache. Um, Long-term effects as we talk about the cardiovascular system include risk for hypertension, stroke, cognitive defects, increased weight, increased risk for diabetes, and then pulmonary and cardiovascular disease. Most of these patients are unaware that they ha have sleep apnea, but they are um, will usually express concerns about the symptoms and how these and symptoms are impacting their um, ability to participate in their daily obligations and impact on their quality of life. Some diagnostic assessments for obstructive sleep apnea. This um, stop bain questionnaire is um, a part of the history taking portion for your patient. Um, the S standing for do you snore loudly? This means loud enough to be heard through closed doors or um, your bed partner may report interruption in their sleep due to snoring. T stands for tired. Do you often feel tired, fatigued, or sleepy during the day? Um, observed. Has, has anyone observed you stop breathing, experience these apnea periods, demonstrate choking or gasping during sleep. P for pressure. Um, have you been treated or currently being treated for high blood pressure? The B is your body mass intake index greater than 35, so this is why you want to take account for their height and weight in your history assessment. Um, age, with the risk factor being associated with age greater than 50. Um, and then neck size. This is, um, is your shirt collar, you may do the measurement or ask about their shirt collar measurement, um, greater than or equal to 16 inches or 40 centimeters gender for G um, with males being at higher risk and then this is scored um, so they're given points for each um, correlation with a positive answer and then that's um, differentiated into their risk factor for OSA so low risk being yes to zero to two questions intermediate risk yes to three to four questions and high risk yes to five to eight questions. In addition to um, the stop bang questionnaire, there's diagnostic testing that can be done at home. This is with um, a sleep study. Um, the patient will sleep in his or her own bed with electronic monitoring of respiratory rate, heart rate, chest movement, eye movement, and any other muscle movement. If this does indicate a sleep apnea problem, usually that patient is going to be referred to have a more in-depth overnight sleep study. Um, known as a polysomnography in which he or she is directly observed during sleep um, while wearing a variety of monitoring equipment to evaluate um, the quality of sleep, type of sleep, respiratory effort, oxygen saturation, carbon dioxide exhalation, and muscle movement. Um, additional monitoring may include an EEG, um, an EKG, um, and a pulse oximetry as well. Prioritizing hypothesis for our client with OSA. Um, primary collaborative problem for patient is persistently poor gas exchange and hypoxia due to abnormal sleep patterns. Um, the potential for abnormal cardiovascular, metabolic, and um, neurological function due to persistent hypoxia and loss of restorative sleep. Most commonly, this is corrected with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation via continuous positive airway pressure. We know this as CPAP therapy. This is to hold open the airway um, to alleviate that obstructive mechanical um, obstruction that's occurring during sleep. Um, this is the most common non-surgical management. We'll talk about some surgical management as well. This, again, CPAP therapy is going to deliver positive airway pressure continuously during each cycle of inhalation and exhalation. Improving duration of restorative sleep. Um, so this is our taking action and management of obstructive sleep apnea. We just talked about some non-surgical um, management. This is for a patient with moderate to severe OSA due to the persistence of poor gas exchange and hypoxia. Um, management strategies will include reducing the obstruction, um, changes in sleep pattern, recommendation of weight loss. There is some positive positioning devices that may be used to keep um, the ornopharynx open and free of obstruction. We talked 
talked about in the previous slide, the CPAP therapy, and there's also some drug management strategies. Now the surgical management, this is considered when patients cannot tolerate CPAP um, or when we know do not note improvement in their obstructive sleep apnea symptoms, therefore their risk factors for complications is not being addressed. There may be surgical management recommended. Um, this can involve placing an electrode in the neck that stimulates the hypo um, glossial nerve. This is cranial nerve 12. Um, you may have seen the commercials for this device. It's a small battery pair charger um, generator that's implanted in the chest looks similar externally to a pacemaker device. So when respiratory effort is slowed during sleep um, and an apnea period occurs, this generator is going to um, send a signal to the stimulator, which will then use mild electrical shocks to cause contraction of appropriate airway muscles and alleviate the mechanical obstruction. Um, these um, shocks are of such low intensity that the patient is not awakened due to this. Um, they're not feeling pain. It's only strong enough to keep the airway open. Now UPP um, surgery, this is a collection of procedures that's usually done under one surgical procedure, um, but this is more complex, it's invasive, um, it's intended to resolve obstructive sleep um, apnea by, res by remodeling the entire posterior oropharynx and removing the tissue that is becoming obstructive during sleep. Your patient who's experienced a UPP post-op care, of course, prioritization looking at her ABCs is going to be maintaining a patient airway. You do have um, a nursing priority critical care rescue box there. Um, prioritization of assessing your patient at least every two hours during the first 24 hours after surgery for indications of airway nearing or partial obstruction. You need to know how to recognize these signs and symptoms in your patient, which would include increased respiratory effort, um, presence of strida, drooling, um, inability to swallow or manage oral secretions, reduction in the size of the oropharynx, desatting O2 sat, um, or if they have um, CO2 monitoring, if you're seeing an increase in the in, um, inner tidal values. If any of these signs are noted, your prioritization is then to initiate rapid response. And then outside of this, prioritization postoperatively is management of pain. Um, when I've cared for patients um, after UPP, um, the most common thing that seemed to help was oral um, elixirs of medications um, of Tylenol and then the ornopharynx has a rich blood supply, um, so making sure we don't note increased signs of excessive bleeding during and after surgery. Um, this can be noted with frequent swallowing by your patient that they're having um, posterior bleeding. Here you'll see um, one type of device to um, utilize for CPAP therapy or positive airway pressure. This is utilizing a nasal mask. This is only purposeful and used for, pa for patients who sleep and mainly utilize nasal breathing. Here in these images you will see different methods for delivery for the positive pressure. So positive pressure delivered to only the nasal airway um, you're seeing in image A. And then B, you see here the subject is wearing um, a nasal pillow. Positive pressure is delivered directly into the nares rather than covering the nose or mouth. So this is more about preference for your patient. Where C, you see here a full face mask. So this is someone who is um, a mouth breather at night. Um, they're not safe to utilize only A or B options. Self-management education is a lot about equipment management and safety, keeping this camp, this um, C, the CPAP therapy um, machine, tubing, mask, all clean to prevent infection, maintain tissue integrity as well. You can imagine the risk for breakdown um, around the mask. With humidification, which is a purposeful part of the system to prevent um, dry mouth, there is increased risk for fungal infections. Most setups are going to require the use of distilled water in the humidifier for that reason. A nearing of the throat or inability to swallow with a royal pain. 
um, and the presence of drooling are indicators that swelling may obstruct the airway. So um, if the patient is noting this, this is important that they go, of course, immediately to um, the ER. And this is when your patient may have more consideration for surgical intervention. Some patients using CPAP therapy for management of type sleep apnea, um, there is a lot of anxiety associated with correct use of the equipment. They feel suffocated by the equipment. Um, they are fearful to sleep with the equipment in place. Um, personal history with family members here has been a lot of daytime use for so them getting comfortable with the mask just being on their face um, without um, the positive pressure applied so it's not secure to their face but they're just getting used to where it will fall on their face um, and ha having them get consistent with use during the night. I had family members who would only wear it for a few hours where they felt themselves taking it off during sleep so it took time and persistence and encouragement for them empowering them to know how to use the equipment and then it's being helpful and not harmful to them about some expected outcomes. We would like to see our OSA patient adherent with prescribed interventions. They have therefore fewer sleep um, interruptions with apnea periods, improved gas exchange with indications of restorative sleep, so they report a reduction in their symptoms, and then therefore reduce the risk of the complications. If they need surgical intervention, that we maintain a patent airway postoperatively, they have an uneventful recovery. Epistaxis or nosebleed begins on page 528 of your text. This um, is usually a result from trauma to the face or nose. Um, also hypertension, this is due to increased pressure in the very delicate vessels of our nares. Um, often occurs after increased pressure in the nasal passages, which can occur from um, sneezing or blowing your nose. Your management strategies are on in a box on page 528. It's important um, for you to know this box, how to emergently manage care for a patient with an interior um, nosebleed maintaining standard precautions, um, position the patient upright with them leaning forward. I know sometimes this requires some redirection. Patients tend to want to tilt their head back but leaning forward. Um, we're trying to prevent the blood from entering the larynx and then having possible aspiration, giving a lot of reassurance during this time as there can be um, concern about the amount of blood being lost during the nosebleed. Therefore, reducing um, an overstimulating environment, keeping um, the patient quiet. This is kind of reducing anxiety or blood pressure. You want to apply direct lateral pressure to the nose for 10 minutes. Um, I've seen the utilization of ice and cold compressions be extremely helpful with vasoconstriction. And the nasal packing um, is usually necessary here. Um, this can be placed at the bedside um, by an advanced pro provider um, physician. Um, this is packed um, typically with, they call a nasal um, rocket or loose packing to both nares. Um, cauterization may be necessary if the packing is not sufficient or we note continuation of bleed with the pressure even after the pressure of packing has been applied. The patient is instructed um, to prevent rebleeding. So after it's been stopped, whether there was need of packing or not, or packing's been removed, we don't want to have um, increased pressure within the nasal pack um, because then we could dislodge the clots that have formed. So um, informing them not to blow their nose for 24 hours after the bleeding stops, try to avoid um, sneezing, and of course instruct the patient to seek medical assistance. If these measures at home are unsuccessful or if the bleeding reoccurs or does not stop. Now posterior nasal bleeding is an emergency. This is when we're noting frequent swallowing with our patient. Assessing for any indications of respiratory distress would also be a reason to initiate or activate a rapid response.
And now after you have removal and management of packing, there are some strategies there listed in your book. It's important for you to know these, to include them um, in our patient education. So use of um, petroleum jelly and nasal saline sprays. We're trying to prevent um, any irritation and dryness within the nares. And again, teaching them to avoid um, the sneezing, coughing, um, blowing their nose strategies. Also, any um, avoidance of vigorous nasal blowing or vigorous exercise, avoiding NSAIDs or aspirin, this is going to increase their risk of bleeding. Um, and the strenuous activities would include like heavy lifting for at least a month um, after um, this event whether or not packing was required. During care, you would also want to use a pulse um, oximetry to manage for hypoxia. So as you're trying to manage this bleed, um, advising your assistive personnel or someone else who's responded to the room as you are not to leave your patient, but make sure that we can get assessment of their O2 sat. And then if um, a nasal rocket or packing is indicated, then making sure that um, your patient is properly oxygenated while they have the packing in place. Usually that packing is going to stay for one to three days. Now we're going to talk about fractures of the nose. This is on page 528 of your textbook. Um, this is either displacement of either the bone or cartilage. Our concern here is of airway obstruction and also of a CSF leak. We'll talk about how it's important to make that assessment. Um, blood or clear fluid, which could possibly indicate cerebral spinal fluid, um, can drain from one side or both nares um, as the result of a simple nasal fracture, and this is more indications of a skull fracture. Um, serious injury, you'd want to be able to differentiate, is this normal nasal secretions? Is this CSF fluid? Um, this can be assessed by a sample of the CSF fluid. Does it contain glucose? If that was positive with the dipstick analysis, you do have CSF fluid um, mixed in with your nasal secretions or blood. The other option here, um, is to have a sample of this clear fluid. As it dries on a piece of filter paper, it's going to have a yellow ring around the outside. This is indications of a positive halo sign and would indicate CSF fluid. How would we manage this? This is going to be closed reduction, rhinoplasty procedure for your patient. Um, Postoperatively, your management, as demonstrated by your action alert box, is going to be assessing for how often your patient is swallowing after surgery. Again, just as we talked about on the previous slide, this may indicate possible um, posterior nasal bleeding. The concern here, again, is that we're not seeing the bleeding. It's occurring posteriorly, and your patient can use, lose massive amounts of blood posteriorly. Um, that we're not able to see. So our indication there is going to be are they swallowing frequently and then we're assessing their, um, their oral cavity. We're using a pen light. Do we see evidence of bleeding posteriorly? Um, notifying this, the surgeon imminently that we see excessive amounts of bleeding. Some more on post-op care after rhinoplasty. We want to have our patient up in semifowlers position to aid in proper oxygenation, cool compresses on their nose, um, face, um, and eyes. There may be a lot of swelling postoperatively. Again, this also helps with vasoconstriction. Um, advancement of their diet with soft foods. We do want to still limit um, vasosalval maneuvers, so having them um, not bear down for bowel movements or hold their breath, um, not have them demonstrate any heavy lifting. Um, antibiotics may be used postoperatively to prevent an opportunistic infection um, that occurred during surgery dress. There's a lot of edema and swelling here. And then humidification of air. Again, trying to make sure those nares don't dry out and increase the risk of bleeding. Your action alert box on page 529. Um, teach the patient still um, avoiding forceful coughing, straining, um, not to do any forceful sniffing, blowing noses, um, especially while this packing is still in place. Uh, continue to avoid any use of NSAIDs or aspirin.
Next, we're going to talk about facial trauma. This is on 529 of your text. Priority here, as always, is your airway. Um, assessing for signs and symptoms of airway obstruction. This is, can include strider, shortness of breath, increased restlessness, anxiety, evidence of hypoxia, decreased O2 sat, cyanosis, which we know is a late sign, and, of course, loss of consciousness as well. Further assessment includes checking for soft tissue edema, facial asymmetry, pain, leakage of spinal fluid, so making sure you still remember from our nasal fractures how we assess for CSF, um, as this could indicate a skull fracture, assessing for vision and eye movement. If there's impairment here, we may have additional orbital maxillary fractures, which can entrap our eye nerves and muscles. We want to check behind the ear of mastoid area for extensive bruising. This is um, um, medical term known as the battle sign, which is also going to be indications of a skull fracture and possible um, intracranial trauma. Now we're going to talk about how we care for our patient who's experienced facial trauma, prioritization of maintaining their airway, um, need to anticipate that your patient may need um, mechanical ventilation um, and have to call rapid response. We got to prioritize controlling hemorrhage, assessing for the extent of injury. Again, int they may experience spinal and intracranial injury as well. If there is a jaw, fra a jaw fracture stabilization and then warranting for further management with surgery. Um, with the prioritization of your airway, I cannot stress the importance of maintaining the need for emergency intubation, tracheotomy, um, may be needlized to stabilize their airway. If your patient is experiencing signs of respiratory distress, again, again those include strider, restlessness. Um, with recent facial trauma, what are you going to do here? We have to initiate rapid response, prepare to assist with intubation, and have supplies ready. Stabilization of the jaw fracture. Um, this is going to be important to allow for proper healing with proper alignment. This is going to include fixed um, occlusion, meaning those jo the jaws are usually going to be wired shut um, with the mouth being in a closed position. This is going to be maintained for six to eight weeks. So when we're talking about our a ABCs here, trying to prevent aspiration, um, your patient's going to need instructions during this six to ten weeks. Um, if they were to experience vomiting, this is significant concern for aspiration due to the wire draw, so the patient's going to need to always have wire cutters um, on pl in place um, on hand with them, um, teach them how to use the wire cutters. If um, vomiting was to occur, any um, jeopardization of um, gas exchange. If they do have to cut through the wires, they then need to follow up with their surgeon to allow for rewiring as soon as possible because, again, we want to maintain um, fixation for six to ten weeks to allow for proper alignment of the jaw. Nursing priority box on 530, this is reiterating, making sure you instruct your patient to keep the wire cutters with them at all times to prevent aspiration if vomiting occurs. Now we're going to talk about laryngeal trauma on page 530. Also as the result of a crushing or direct blow injury fracture um, can also occur with prolonged endotracheal intubation or intubation that was done emergently. Prioritization here is to maintain a, a patent airway utilizing um, application of oxygen and humidification. Surgical intervention may also be warranted depending on the extent of the trauma. Cancer of the nose and sinuses, page 531 of your text. Um, risk include exposure to dust um, from wood, textiles, leather, um, nickel, muscle gas, radium, um, cigarette smoking, of course. This usually is slow onset. Symptoms resemble chronic sinusitis. Patient may also experience limp enlargement, um, often on one side as the tumor increases in size. This is going to also be concerned for spread of the malignancy to the lymphatic system. Um, prioritization is usually to surgical removal with um, combination therapy of radiation and chemotherapy. So post-op manage or sorry, pre-op and post-op management is going to be similar to chapter nine, maintaining a patent airway, monitoring for hemorrhage, um, wound care, um, prioritization of nutrition status. Um, likely patient may have um, and tracheotomy, so ensuring they're comfortable with their trach care. We'll talk about that more in our upcoming 
chapters, making sure they um, can perform careful mouth and sinus cavity care, which may include um, saline ir irrigations, like with a water pick or sonic care system, or they may be utilizing a syringe, um, an assessment for monitoring of pain and infection with this therapy. The neck cancer, this is on page 531 of your text. This is usually a squamous cell carcinoma. Slow growing begins with mucosal that appears chronically irritated. We talked about this um, in previous chapters related to oral cancer. Um, over time, this becomes tougher and thicker in appearance. Um, there may be evidence of leukoplakia and erythropoikia lesions, and then the risk for metastasis into local lymph nodes, muscle bone, um, and then distal progression. The prognosis um, for those who have advanced disease um, depends on the extent and location of the tumors. Um, unfortunately, these cancers are often fatal within two years of diagnosis. Risk factors for head and neck cancer include tobacco and alcohol use, um, voice abuse, chronic laryngitis, exposure to chemicals and dust, poor oral hygiene, long-term GERD. Um, remember uh, the um, discussion we had about Barrett's esophagus and then oral infection with HPV. History taking, asking about history of tobacco and alcohol use and the other risk factors on the previous slide, any difficulty swallowing, lumps in the neck they've noticed, um, signs and symptoms may also include hoarseness, change in the quality of their voice, mouth sores, table 23.2 lists the warning signs of head and neck cancer. This is on page 532 of your text. Imaging assessment, this is going to determine the extent um, of the cancer, its invasiveness that helps plan or prioritize tr treatment strategies for your patient may include initially x-rays, um, CT, MRI for assessment of um, bone and tissue, and then more spec um, and um, imaging to assess for metastasis. We're going to talk about um, non-surgical and surgical interventions. Non-surgical is going to focus on biotherapy, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. Your prioritization here would be teaching to include with these. So with salivary glands um, being in the pathway of radiation, we talked about this with oral cancer, um, the mouth may become extremely dry. Unfortunately, this can be long-term and may be permanent due to the effects of radiation therapy. So ongoing management for your patient is going to be strategies to combat the dry mouth. They're going to need a dental consult, um, the risk of cavities here, and just oral decline due to the lack of um, salvation. Um, this is increased with radiation in the dry mouth, so the patient may have extractions of teeth during and prior to radi radiation. You want to advise your patient on how to use moisturizing sprays, increase water intake, humidification to help ease the discomfort of dry mouth. Um, extensively, your patient is likely going to need some, some surgery intervention as well. This may include um, laryngectomy, so total or partial removal of the larynx. It may include um, a trach placement, um, oral pharyngeal cancer resections, um, similar to what we talked about with our oral cancers in previous modules. If cancer is in the lymph nodes, um, the surgeon may perform a partial or full um, radical neck dissection, which is where they're taking um, groups of those lymph nodes for determination of metastasis and prioritization of their treatment plan and trying to prevent further metastasis. Complications after surgery, so going back to our post-op care is prioritization of their airway, they're at risk for airway obstruction, they're at risk for bleeding, um, they're at risk for wound breakdown around their surgical sites, um, for fistula formation, they're likely going to have drains in place, um, and of course reoccurrence of their tumor and cancer. So making sure that they know that um, most, most of it is um, not curative, it's more um, palliative and treatment of, of that at the moment, and then so they have to keep their follow-up appointments for assessment of return.
Laryngectomy post-op care, your patient may also have tissue flaps, as we saw the video in previous modules. This is to used to help close the wound, improve appearances. These are flaps of skin, subcutaneous tissue. Um, sometimes can utilize muscle flaps as well. This taken from other egregies of the body and used for reconstruction. So your first 24 hours after surgery are critical, evaluating the graft sites um, and where the flaps were transferred, monitoring for cap refill, color, drainage, Doppler activity. So most of your patients are going to have Dopplers in place in these flaps where you can assess for pulsation um, in that area. Your patient's going to likely have an NG tube, um, a gastrotomy tube, G tube is placed during surgery for nutritional support because we know this is um, prioritization of their healing. Maintaining um, airway patency, gas exchange. We'll talk about how to ma manage a trach, trach care, um, trach suctioning. Um, assessing for signs and symptoms of hemorrhage, any wound breakdown around those um, surgical sites, and um, your trach plate as well, prioritization of their pain management, and then planning for speech and language um, rehab. Communication after laryngectomy is going to include use of electrolarynx. This is um, a specialist that will be involved in your healthcare team, your speech and language pathologist. This um, image here shows the use of electrolarynx externally to help a patient communicate. Um, you can imagine how restrictive this may feel, and the more we empower um, them to properly use an electrolarynx, well, aid in their quality of life and their post-op recovery. Care coordination and transition management for your patients who's had laryngectomy. Its effects on um, appearance can be devastating. Um, facial appearance, self-image, speech and communication. So a lot of psychosocial impacts that we have to prioritize. There's a coordination of a massive interprofessional team approach to so making sure upon discharge your patient is familiar with who those resources are, their follow-up appointments, contact information. Commonly, this is going to include an oncologist, a surgeon, um, registered dietitian, nutritionist, speech language pathologist, your dentist, respiratory therapist, social worker, caseworker. You also usually have a wound care specialist, occupational and physical therapist, and then the psychosocial counselors. The mechanical device, such as the electrolarynx, making sure they know how to use these. These are battery powered devices. Um, did they know proper placement of them for utilization? Um, usually it's the air inside the mouth and throat that's vibrating, and that's what the electrolarynx device is picking up on and projecting. So it requires different techniques um, than what we usually know speech to consist of, but they're still utilizing and movement of their lips and tongue as well. Um, it does sound robotic, so having them prepare for how the quality of their voice is not going to be what it was before, um, and that may be new um, for them. Extensive home care preparation is needed after a laryngectomy um, and maintaining of their airway. Most of them travel to a facility to have this done, so they're not close to home, so making sure even they feel um, that they can transport well. Does their caregiver know how to manage um, an impaired airway, an impaired trach? Um, on the way home if they were to experience an acute mucus plug. You have your patient and family education box on 535.